so it will be only three of us <laughs> and even yesterday i think george had the maximum problem connecting no but uh, here it should be uh what six of us yeah yes so fahim probably will join george okay sherry we didn't we didn't see any mail from two people rolf and i think sherry roberts Now, Sherry sent an email a few minutes ago saying yeah. she was connected, but we don't see her anywhere. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Are you attending any of the other sessions? There seems to be like a big yeah. series of sessions today and tomorrow. It's two days. Two days, yes. Yeah, perhaps I'll jump in just to see. I might, I might, I'll attend one or two as well. Yeah. Hello again. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Is uh, sound okay? Yes. Okay. There we go. Uh, yeah, I think like uh, five minutes and we start. Um, So I don't see Sherry actually, and for him, yeah, I'll just email them and ask if they're joining. Let me see. Yeah, Sherry just sent an email, but yeah, it, she's here, but I don't see her. Uh, yeah, let's uh, also a, a, another note that uh, once we do not speak, we can just set up mute, so that'll be you know quiet. <laughs> so yeah. Also, it's a suggestion that we, when we are not speaking, that we put mics on for, on uh, mute during the session. Okay. Hi guys. Hey, Fahim. Hi, Fahim. Fahim, where where are you based right now? San Francisco. Oh, so you're still so you're even further behind than I am. Okay. Yeah, still, uh, still on, still in September. You guys have already started a, a new month. I'm still a month behind. <laughs> yeah. Fahim, tell us a little bit more about your company. Uh. I used to be a category manager at Amazon. I managed one of their largest categories globally and left about six years ago and started a you know, consultancy focused on mostly Amazon in the U.S., although we do some international marketplaces. But we work with a bunch of the leading brands in the U.S. to manage their Amazon business. Not as exciting as voice commerce, I can tell you that. But, but you must be making a lot more money than I do. Because oh, I have to first sell the idea that it'll work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're uh, I guess we're all always in selling mode, right? Everything is about right. sell, sell, sell. How many people do you have? Uh, we got about ten full time and some contractors. We're fairly lean. We try to. Try to be very focused for now. Um, uh, I've heard enough horror stories about scaling a consultancy too fast, so we've, we try to keep it nice and nimble. Amazon is a very big business by itself. I think. Yeah. Nobody can ignore Amazon. Yeah, and kind of the interesting thing is, you, know, you look at their market cap and how valuable they are, but they're only really dominant in a handful of countries across the world, which is kind of crazy to think their market value. So. Obviously, in the U.S. and U.K. and Germany a little bit, Japan a little bit more. They don't do much in India yet. Nearly they nothing in China. A little bit. They're getting there, but still, kind of percent market share. A long way to go. I think uh, Walmart um, uh, has it uh, has a good plan as well. At least in India. And then they they acquired Souk. They don't do that much in the Middle East, South uh, America. Very little uh, business. You start going across the globe, and you say this company is worth one of the 
top most valued public companies in the world and it's a handful of countries that they're dominant in, which I don't know, both a good and a bad thing, I guess. Good for me. As long as, uh, as long as it keeps, uh, keeps, uh, keeps business going, that's good. No, what is scary is, you know, all these systems, you know, monsters like Amazon, Facebook, social media, you know, all these guys, they have their own rules and they can do whatever they want, you know. Yep. You can, they can kick you off and uh, out and block you and do whatever, you know, they wish, compete with you, with your yeah. own data. And there is no way uh, how to, how to, you know, defend yourself. No yeah. legal system, nothing. Yeah. I, I heard that now it's in the States, it's a very fast growing group of consultants, which are just, let's say, some kind of mediators between Amazon and those companies which are suffering, let's say, some consequences of being blocked or you know, mm-hmm. um, yep. uh, not treated properly on Amazon. Yeah, it is ruthless. You kind of, you're, you're, you're guilty until proven innocent on Amazon, for better or for worse. Just, just a quick question. Uh, was anyone already being blocked on Amazon, just from you guys? Yeah, no. we had a bunch. Uh, no, I, mean, like, I mean, none of you have been blocked, right? Uh, no, not blocked. Some of our clients have had times where they've been blocked. We had to get them unblocked. Hi, Sherry. We were sorry, missing sorry. You. I ended up on a speed networking by mistake. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, I think we can, um, yeah, I, I like the idea we can start a little bit with uh, Amazon experience because, you know, I've been blocked <laughs> and I know what it looks like to be blocked and there is no, completely no way to be unblocked and to restore your oh, reputation. Really? I mean, it's... Uh, I mean, it, even when you try to register a new account, nothing related to you personally or your company, they still find out. But the interesting thing that they charge you money first, and mm-hmm. and they say, "Oh, okay, we see that your account, new account, is related to the one was blocked. We are sorry." Yep. And they never refund you money. <laughs> it's yeah. so it's so weird. Yeah, I think yep. we like one minute before, and why? Um, let, let's just start because we, we already had uh, this uh, conversation. So, um, yeah, I want to welcome all uh, people that are uh, joining us uh, this, this morning. And for some people, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, later evening. So, um, yeah, let me introduce myself and then um, we'll, um, I'll introduce my panelists. So, uh, my name is George Konektev and, and I'm a moderator of this uh, session. And we're going to talk about uh, very interesting transforming things that are happening in uh, e-commerce and um, in global business right now. So uh, as an introduction, I want to say that uh, many years ago, I saw horror image of the abandoned trade centers in big cities like uh, St. Louis, Detroit. You've probably seen them. Uh, internet, I've never been there or saw them in person. But, you know, the picture is kind of devastating. So um, a few weeks ago, I've been in Moscow. I'm not living in Moscow right now. I'm living in a smaller city called Smolensk, 300 miles southwest. But uh, the, the picture is, you know, looks like big malls suffer dawn times everywhere. So it'll be like a new, we're entering a new paradigm of retail business. And uh, like 20 years ago, I was talking to many retailers in my native city, Smolensk, when I tried to explain retailers and, you know, online store, uh, sorry, stores that they need to go online, that there will be a new shift where people, when people will buy and use stuff online. So they didn't listen to me. Uh, They're ready to listen now, but I'm afraid it's uh, a little bit too late. So uh, as, as people pro- probably see and noted that we still see more cases around the world and around the globe that uh, COVID is not uh, finished yet and the risk of a uh, global shutdown uh, appears again. Or if it's not a hard lockdown, then it could be like a small or like local lockdowns and some fear that these lockdowns can can uh, can appear so like a feeling of another great depression. So uh, today we're going to talk about what problems do we face in e-commerce. Probably you've heard like five years ago when Tabao vendor 
travels over 500 miles to beat up woman for bad review. But it was five years ago, so it could happen now. So people are very care, uh, they are very careful about their reviews. So the remote shopping and strongly personalized digital trade shows have hundred United consumers. So people rely more on uh, someone's review rather than believe in their own demands. Another thing that I want to talk is about uh, how to decide between the personal touch or the digital persuasion. So companies, customer service, most companies, they say that they care about their customer service. And in fact, I'm not really positive that they do. I mean, how many companies reply in live chat within five seconds? How many companies reply to your emails within, let's say, 60 seconds? And how many companies do ship uh, something if you order it like within a minute? So this is a big, a big uh, challenge for an entire company. Another thing that are uh, two more things that uh, we need to discuss about uh, digital trends. So will they continue and uh, what is the perspective of those uh, of those trends? And the last thing we probably need to speak a little bit, and I, I know that Fahim had some, some thoughts about it, uh, are the return of digital goods significantly higher than for traditional purchase and in terms of uh, talking about pollution. So, uh, yeah, let me start with uh, our panel with uh, questions to Tina. So, Tina, you're from uh, India, and I'd like to hear your thoughts and your views about current situation on, on the market. And uh, yeah, you, you spoke about uh, yesterday about some interesting things that you want to highlight. So, uh, yeah, you're welcome to start our panel. You can probably introduce yourself like for, so everyone can for like five uh, five minutes of your, your time. So go ahead, please. Sure. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, getting me into this discussion. Uh, so the, my introduction is I'm Tina Mani. I'm the CEO of Wife Fred. Uh, we have built a voice commerce platform, and our goal is to uh, improve the customer experience so that uh, digital experience becomes almost as close to human uh, buying as possible. So um, in the recent times, we've seen uh, during COVID, uh, there were two scenarios that we've seen. Uh, one is that more and more businesses have been pushed to digital, just like uh, George said, uh, either by force or because uh, mostly because they had to, right? And uh, since it's very new for them, it's not been easy, first of all, for them to go to digital. Um, and uh, the second thing is that uh, the availability of products has been very broken. So um, we found that the local stores near our uh, areas were serving the customers much better because they were able to uh, give sources to uh, give uh, products to people that are close by. And uh, whenever you ordered something from an online business, uh, it would take a lot of time because of the breakage in the transport. There were hot zones, COVID zones, and all that stuff. So that, uh, that led to another uh, interesting behavior among the physical store owners is that they had a lot of conversations with the customers. And uh, interestingly, in India, WhatsApp is a very common mode of uh, communication. And the store owners would actually have WhatsApp conversations with the customers to uh, decide about what they wanted, and they would have them delivered to the home. Uh, so uh, I think, in short, uh, the real optimal mode of commerce would be omnichannel, where uh, digital experience becomes as close to a conversation as possible, and a physical store has all the right tools or right information within the store to serve the customers. Uh, so think of uh, think of a scenario where um, where a customer starts his interaction at home in a conversational manner. So we have a voice platform where a person can just start talking uh, using a Google Assistant, right? So a customer can say, "Okay, Google, talk to Shopper Stop," and they start the conversation and uh, they have questions about the products and. Uh, they can also check availability. Uh, at the other end, uh, the guy in the store also has a conversational interface uh, where he can see the requests coming in. Uh, he has access to all the product information 
and he can respond to the customer uh, right there. Uh, so that completely transforms the experience from a one-sided, uh, you know, experience where the customer looks for stuff, doesn't find it, and moves on, uh, to a two-way conversational street. So that's that's what um, I believe uh, is the future of commerce. I'd, I'd park it here and uh, ask others to move on. I'll be happy to join in the question answer session again. Yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right that uh, there is a new way of communication with customers like omnichannel. And yes. uh, I see a big lack of that because I, I just don't know about all of you guys, but is it possible to communicate to, uh, to shoppers via like WhatsApp, Viber, Telegram? Do they open these channels? Because I, I am just very honest about this. So half of my business goes from omnichannel. So I have all kind of messengers available and people write me on WhatsApp, they email me, they, they add comments on Facebook, they uh, add comments on YouTube. So this is omnichannel. I must say that it's also difficult to support because you know you wake up in the morning and you need to check all uh, all posts, all comments, but that's how people, uh, you know, want to interact. They they want to, I don't know, they use the, this service and they want uh, you to answer in this in this messenger. So, uh, would anyone like to to maybe like one minute to talk about this on the channel uh, challenge? Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, WhatsApp has become a very common means of communication, like you said, as well as Facebook Messenger. Uh, what we have seen recently is that WhatsApp has also opened up a shopping interface uh, because uh, usually the, the, con the original uh, problem with WhatsApp was that it wasn't meant for shopping. So people, the business would have to upload images and send it to the customer, which is not optimal. Uh, right now, WhatsApp is also introducing a multi-mode interface with images and text and everything in one place. Um, however, we we are betting on Google Assistant just because it's on every single device, Android TV and everything, uh, without an installation. Uh, so we're looking at Google Assistant. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I'm sure that every uh, interface is going to become a commerce friendly. Like Facebook Messenger is commerce friendly today. You have the uh, ability to build a Facebook Messenger bot. WhatsApp is adding the interface very soon. And Google Assistant has already got the support. So it's one by one, every social media channel is adding the ability to have a conversation between brands and customers. Yeah, so it's a good point. We can uh, get back to it uh, in a Q&A uh, segment. So uh, yeah, the next one I would like to talk a little bit. Um, I'd like to hear a talk from Brandon. So uh, Brandon, you're from uh, US, and he's a CEO of uh, uh, Dynamico, right? Yeah, Dynamico. And uh, you are running like B2B uh, business model, helping companies to grow. Yeah, by the way, how, how things are going in Minneapolis so far and uh, any interesting sales um, case studies you're working on? So you're welcome to share the experience. Yeah, well, let me start. Um, so again, hi, I'm Brendan Denable. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Dynamico. I'm actually originally from a small fishing town on the west coast of Africa in Namibia. And I remember the, the first time I went with my father down to the port where he where he worked and you know, going past all the ships. And, and he explained to me, as we were going past each ship, what country they were from, what language they were speaking, showed me that they all had these different flags. And I, I, I remember thinking to myself, this, is, this must be completely chaotic where you have all these ships coming from the countries all over the world into this, into this one port speaking different languages. How, does, how, do, how do they work in that chaos? And that, that always intrigued me. And then, of course, every time I went back there, which was at least once a month, these same ships were coming back and everything was working. They were unloading their fish or their cargo. And I guess it intrigued me so much that in my early 20s, I, I wanted to work on one of those on one of those ships and, and went to sea on a fishing, a big fishing trawler. And for those of you who might have seen The Deadliest Catch, and if you haven't seen The Deadliest Catch, uh, you know, 
fishermen have a pretty rough life. Uh, you, you're out in the deep ocean and you're fishing in storms and high seas. And the, the ship that I was on, in fact, we used to catch the fish, process the fish, and then pack the fish in for eight different markets across the world, in, in, again, in different languages, um, with in, individual, in, in unique packaging for each one. And we did this every 45 days. We would bring the, the frozen fish back to the port and load up and go out and do it again. And again, and on, there were like 80 of us on, on this ship. There were probably about 13 languages spoken on the ship. But again, there was a system, there was a process, and everything worked. Then when I left that company because the, the fishing company was, was sold, I found myself in, the, in a new industry, which in fact happened to be as stormy and as chaotic, which is helping businesses navigate the changes in technology, which I started doing 10 years ago. And of course, I, saw, I started seeing a lot of similarities that as technology changes and as digital has a bigger impact, we're, we're, we're finding ourselves in the same, the same storms and chaos as I did you know, as a young boy and then in my first career as a, as a fisherman. And what's happened in the last six months, of course, has just accelerated that, that whole chaos and, and accelerated the change, which is, is not going to go away. And I, I see this as a, a big positive and a big opportunity. And to me, the single focus for us as a, as a consulting business to, to many businesses who have to figure this out if they want to survive, um, and not only survive, but, but thrive, is to focus on one thing, and that is that personalized purchasing experience for the, for the customer. So, you know, you know, Tina and George, you just sort of touched on, on various modes and omni-channel to do that. But the, but the point is you have to do whatever you need to do based on what the customer expects. And if you don't, you know, then uh, you, you will have problems, especially if, if your, your competitors figures, figure out that, that solution that can provide that personalized service. So, you know, I, we, we work with in, in, in the B2B space, but in many cases also, you know, B, B2B to C, where we're helping our, our clients who are businesses adapt to their technology, their sales and marketing process, to what their customers expect. And a lot of that, of course, is impacted, of course, by, by and in many cases, we call it the Amazonification of, of the world, which is, you know, Amazon led the way and everybody else is, is trying to catch up and follow. And they will, they, they seem to continue to, to, to lead the way. And we're seeing that in, in every industry, including B2B, because that is what we as customers now expect. We expect the same way that, that our groceries are delivered and, and everything else that we buy online. That's how we expect to, to do commerce in our businesses too. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for now, but um, I'm, I'm very excited about what the last six months of this disruption have done and have accelerated uh, where, we, where we're going. So you actually did leave uh, fishery business or did not? Yes, I did. So, yeah, so the, the it, company I was at, yeah, the company I was at was was sold. Oh. So I, I had to, you know, my my wife and I said, well, let's maybe it's time to do something different. And and she was from from Minneapolis, which is back to your question, George, which is how we ended up eventually back in Minneapolis after spending five years in Spain, uh, which is where we started our company, which is why the the name of the company Dynamico is a play on the Spanish word for dynamic, Dynamico. Okay. But eventually ended up where her family is in, in Minneapolis, which of course, as everybody knows, is you know, again just you know this this summer has been you know sort of ground zero for many other issues. But um, but we we seem to be we, you know we're we're all doing doing okay. But we have a long road ahead of us on that on that aspect as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon, for sharing. So um, the next panelist I would like to talk. Um, is, um, Sherry Roberts, uh, we missed you yesterday, but then we follow up after after our initial rehearsal. So Sherry's been uh, doing running a business and helping people to shop uh, to to furnish their their homes in a new way. So she's been doing it for seven years, starting uh, at uh, 
2013, I guess. And uh, it seems like it was a long path and was not so easy to, to go against the wind because I understand that that business, when you sell something like uh, furniture, perfume, it's not kind of obvious how to bring the value to a customer, how to explain it. And so can you share your view, how you struggled with that, how you, uh, pay, what problems did you face that time and what opportunities do you face now? Because, I, I, you know, I've always quote Kennedy when he said that crisis has two meanings. One is uh, danger, like a fear, and the other one is opportunity. So uh, tell me, tell me, Sherry, uh, What's your what's your feelings about this topic? Well, it's not a short answer. The journey, <laughs> it's been a long road. So back in 2010, um, I had a vision which was people wanted to buy what they saw in hotels. So that meant, you know, um, being able to furnish hotels and allowing people to bring that back home. And at the time, furniture wasn't even bought on the internet, especially designer furniture, let alone furniture that was in hotels. And then I also discovered that people wanted to buy what they saw in home decoration magazines but couldn't easily get it. And I said, okay, let me start with problem one and then I'll move into problem two. So problem one was creating a website that looked like shopping in a magazine so you could get what was in the magazine. So we had to launch editorial and content and I was living in Italy at the time, so I had to learn Italian, and then I had to learn to get the Italian brands to come on the Internet, which took me three solid years of evangelizing the Italian market. So by 2013, I had my first 30 Italian brands to go on the Internet, and I created my first online magazine. And having a, a, a background that was actually in mobile tech for many years, so I had to learn e-commerce and retail and Italian and furniture and photo shoots and all of that. So I had you know about four different industries to learn in in a business. So, and I said, well, once I get this kind of trading and we become big and people know the longest stay is furnish a home you never want to leave, maybe the hotels will want to talk to me and I can make them shoppable. Then I'll be able to get projects for hotels and I can kind of retail and merchandise what goes in the hotel rooms and I can put that onto my online platform. So having this vision in 2010, so one might take a few years, well, we're now in 2020 and I'm now starting my first hotels. So um, the path, <laughs> the path was quite a long one because when you're a first mover advantage, what I call it an advantage, um, you also can be the first mover who dies. So um, it was a question of what kind of investment do I need to scale this business? And I kept thinking, do I take three, four million and do I go on my crowd cube and try to raise a lot of money? And how do I do it? And then I, I sat back and I said, the best thing you can do is be quiet, is just be organic and be quiet and just kind of let someone else that's going to go raise some big money and open up the furniture market. So I kind of took angel investment here and there, 50K, 100K, 200K. And I kept kind of and I was growing. It wasn't that I wasn't growing. I was taking 30 brands and I had 50 brands and I had Portuguese brands and Danish brands. And, you know, and I, I kept producing content and producing content, one expense. So back in 2013, 14, and you were making pages clickable online, you were having to code every page. So it was an expensive process. Anyway, to make a long story short, made.com in the UK opened up, which became a very large mass market online furniture business, producing furniture in China and bulk shipping it over. Um, and so it was, it, it disrupted the market. And so I just said, well, if people are willing to buy designer furniture on the internet that's cheap, they'll soon be ready to buy luxury furniture on the internet that's more expensive. And that started happening in 2018, 2019, where the luxury furniture, and then all the competitors started saying, oh, we're going to be the new net porter for home, you know, which was the big fashion site. And I said, well, okay, great. So, and you saw them start, take a lot of money, run out of money and go under. And you saw this pattern and I just kept staying the longest day, the little, you know, organic brand that will eventually blossom. 
Um, and so right before COVID, we had launched a new website because obviously the old one uh, was a dinosaur and we wanted to make a progressive web application, which we're doing. And we never did a mobile app because we never believed anyone would ever download it, which they don't, even though 50% of transactions are now done on mobile. So we're looking at the progressive web app. Um, and right before COVID, we had signed our first hotel project, which was uh, a huge project in Croatia for uh, 250 rooms, which would have been started now if we didn't have COVID, but that's fine because we know that eventually the project will start and we will start to create shoppable hotels. Um, I will tell you back in 2013, I went to Nick Jones, who owned Soho House for investment, and he said, what a great idea. Why don't you come do it for me? And I said, but there's no scale. You're a few members clubs. You never be a billion dollar company selling what's in a few members club. I need to create a platform that powers every hotel. And funny enough, he launched Soho Home, see, so which is what he has his own brand, which sells what's in his members clubs, which, as I said, will be what it is. And um, so I feel like I helped, you know, evolve an industry. I paid a price because I was, you know, always kind of looking for, you know, to, to grow a little bit and never. But I control the company. I have 25 shareholders and I own over 60 percent. And I've done that over 10 years. And so now I have my larger investors looking to come in, which I will give control, some control to, and we will now scale it. And the market now is ready, and we do have hotels, and we have an online business that we have seen even during COVID. People picking up their product from the warehouse themselves and putting it into their house because they absolutely want what we have. And they weren't going to let COVID get in the way, and we were going to stop them from going to the warehouse. So... We've seen um, we've seen that when people want what they want, they want it, and they will text you and what's up you. And yes, of course, if they can voice activate every order and not have to type in a keyword on Google, it makes it easier. So there's loads of things that I see now. This is the only business, one of the only businesses to invest in is e-commerce because it's we are dependent. Whether there's a virus, whether there will be a war, hopefully never, you will always know that e-commerce is something you can count on, and Amazon has definitely demonstrated that with doubling their profit last quarter. Hopefully that wasn't too long. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, that's... I left you speechless, George. That's not the point. <laughs> Are you there, George? Yeah, it seems like... Yeah, it seems like my connection is not stable. I just see... Uh, some messages that uh, yeah, I just have some flipping voices and we can yeah, hear you I fine now, George. Like to give an yeah, we can hear you fine now. I will restart. Okay, I'll restart my uh, connection. I have a few <laughs> reserved lines, but uh, yeah, I would like uh, Sandy to 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 start his uh, his pitch. Hi, hello everybody. I'm Sandy Tuesko. I'm from Slovenia. A uh, small country of two million people only. Uh, so in my early days, I had to go, you know, outside of the country, uh, being globalized uh, to reach some meaningful size of the business. I started actually with computer business in late 80s and then jumped into direct marketing. And I built uh, one of the leading uh, multi-channel retailers, Studio Moderna in Eastern Europe. Uh, with my wife, we grew the business from zero to 500 million euros uh, with no capital raised and all organic growth with about 8,000 employees uh, in total across 20 markets uh, in Eastern Europe, including Russia, from Albania to North uh, in Scandinavia. Um, today, then I sold the business uh, to four big private equity companies and uh, I invested the money in new technologies. One of those is uh, Spring, Belgium technology, Spring, which is made from the foam which I'm using now in um, B2C area uh, in the matrices. Uh, this was the original purpose of acquiring this technology, um, up to aviation, automotive, uh, furniture, etc., etc. It is technology, uh, it's 50% more green than a block of foam, and it has uh, fantastic, uh, let's say, superior performances. Uh, we are selling... Uh, I was actually the first one, you are familiar with the bet in the box concept. I was the first one probably who started with this concept in 2002. So before Casper uh, showed up in the States, 
uh, this business uh, back in the box in Eastern Europe was already 200 million in revenues. Today I'm doing this business globally from United States all across Europe and Japan, Australia, uh, everywhere you can find our brand. Um, actually, UK is our uh, probably single largest market with Bermeo brand. Okay, well, so can you tell tell us more about uh, what uh, opportunities and what global trends you see in terms of uh, current e-commerce? So maybe you can share yeah. your customer experience as as you being a customer and what customers expect from your business. So what is important? Yeah. So let's say, as it was said, in last 90 days of the lockdown, we have seen bigger shift towards uh, uh, e-commerce than in last 10 years, but not only e-commerce, you know, across all the uh, sectors, uh, you know, with education, um, medicine, everybody is now, you know, smelling cup of coffee and realized you have to be heavily digitalized if you want to stay in the game. That's that's the only way. Um, and actually, you know, it was also, although we are always praising, you know, Amazon and the West, but actually, um, you know, uh, China uh, is today, it's not yet a leader and the number one economy in the world is not the strongest, etc., uh, etc., et but it is far ahead with the digitalization, you know, from any other company in the world. They have two times more sales uh, via internet than, uh, uh, let's say, even the States, you know, not, not saying even that there is 30% of total retail in China is done via e-commerce, you know, not mentioning digital payments and all these kinds of things. So here, the West is really uh, lagging behind, probably because we are too spoiled with other distribution possibilities, like, you know, big shopping malls and right. all, all this. Mm -hmm. So China made this uh, leapfrog effect. So um, talking about what was already addressed here about the customer service, what we are seeing. Mm -hmm. Look, today, I mean, what I have noticed already before is that um, uh, all the products will become commodities. And that the key differentiator anymore is not in the product. Everybody has a quality product. Every car is today good quality. E everything what you touch more or less is a very, very good quality. So this is not anymore key differentiator. Key differentiator is in the service. You know? All right. What kind of customer service is provided from you know uh, connecting uh, with the customers uh, to solving their complaints, you know, and the whole supply chain and everything. And this is uh, a key element. I'm personally, uh, as also Tina said, she believes in multi-channel. I was my investors uh, uh, in the old company, previous company, they always pushed me towards e-commerce. I always said I would be channel agnostic, but all channels should be highly digitalized. You see? This yeah. is the process. So talking about the e-commerce and internet is not only uh, e-commerce as such, but every shop, every, uh, uh, every uh, point in the business process, in the whole supply chain has to be completely digitalized. You know, even the brick and mortar shops will stay, but it will, they will be heavily digitalized or they will have no purpose to exist. Yeah, I, so I, I experience. Yeah, I fully agree. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, interesting topic about, once again, we, we return to customer experience, and it seems like this is a key key thing, key point of entire uh, digitalization and entire e-commerce, because uh, it's something that is, is rock solid of your business, because, I mean, the product can be, you know, different. Anyone else can make something, some substitute or some alternative to your product, but it's kind of difficult to make the same customer relations, I mean, to copy it exactly with this uh, timeline. Uh, I had a, uh, some interesting experience when people came, well, when, when people are um, were asking about like lasers and they come to our website and then we did like follow-ups and say, hey, you was interested. And one customer from Australia actually wrote me that his home was in fire. And, you know, it's, I mean, this is for me for running the business for email him was a wrong time because, you know, I said, well, I'm looking for a laser and he said, well, I get a problem. My home was burned and, you know, it's like a devastating feeling. So uh, what could I do in this case? I just 
well, if I say sorry and uh, I just didn't know how to react. And then I spoke to my wife and she said, well, just what would you, what would you expect? And then, well, I would expect some help. Well, not expect, but would be nice to get it. And I wrote that guy and say, hey, can you send me your PayPal account? I'll, I'll send you like, I, I cannot send you much, but maybe like 20, 25 bucks will be, will be something good. You know, and he was very impressed. And then I understood that it could be, you know, like reverse attitude when it, you are talking to a customer, to someone you can earn money, but then you, you give him money. And then we started to do, you know, such giveaway seed units. For example, uh, when we see that a person is expecting something uh, uh, like an upgrade, we, sell, we send these upgrades for free because we want them to feel happy that they join, they bought. We can't hear you. Fahim, do you want to speak since George? Yeah. Okay, let me, can, can I just uh, yeah. add one, 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 one comment? Sandy. Yes, please. Yeah, just, just one comment. You know, we are all talking about, you know, um, customer service from our point to them. But, you know, um, there is also uh, uh, one more element which I would like to add here. I started about 15 years ago. So I never had consultants because I was I had this disruptive business model. So I never hired consultants because consultants can only sell you the past, you know, experience. And you know, I was always about something new. So who are my main consultants today in the business, and who are guiding me? I have established customer advisory board, mm. and they are my main advisors. They know my company better than I know them. So you know, it is uh, it's not only one way process. You know, and I have customer advisory boards in every country for every brand. And now, two days ago, I have read about uh, the story about American Eagle, you know, a retailer. It's the only apparel brand and retailer in the States, which is doing um, with um, uh, uh, brick and mortar stores, you know, having better results and growing uh, um, than, than, than before. You know, apparently the only retail brand in apparel still standing and still growing. And one of their secret ingredients is customer advisory boards. Mm -hmm. And they told them how to change, what to do, what kind of clothes, apparel, you know, they should introduce. So, you know, it's not only what we can do for them. They can do also a lot for us. Sorry. Um, yeah. Am I back? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can you hear me well? Yep. Yes. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, another thing that uh, I want to talk about for him was uh, telling yesterday that um, there could be some some controversial uh, feeling about uh, emission uh, carbon dioxide in terms of COVID. So, uh, for him, you was telling us yesterday that there is some sort of research uh, that does not prove that we have less emission right now because people are expecting you know more uh, faster delivery they're expecting you know better packaging so uh, is there something you want to talk about <clears throat> absolutely uh, i'll give a quick intro and if you bear with me since i'm a consultant i have a couple of slides i'll, I'll go quickly but uh otherwise i'll always lose myself and it helps me uh, <laughs> stay organized so um, quick background, uh, I used to be a category manager at Amazon. I managed one of their largest cat categories globally. Um, prior to that, I uh, did corporate finance and strategy at Office Depot. And what actually interested me when I was in the brick and mortar space is, believe it or not, Office Depot was the largest e-commerce player in the world before Amazon really started getting big because a big part of their contract business went there. So I was very fascinated by this idea of e-commerce while retail was in its heyday and opening up stores left and right and um, the recession hit. And that's when I decided I wanted to leave retail. I wanted to go into this little thing called e-commerce that everybody keeps talking about. Um, and I've been um, in some capacity uh, in, in e-commerce ever since. I left Amazon 
about six years ago, started a consultancy focused on helping brands um, sell online, primarily on Amazon. We've uh, worked with a bunch of the leading companies, um, primarily in North America, but some international companies uh, to manage their businesses on Amazon. And probably the last three or four years, we became a lot more focused on direct-to-consumer brands. So these brands that started popping up um, left and right, uh, and you start hearing about, and your friends are starting to talk about that haven't been around as long, but they've been built digitally, and, and they understand everything about Facebook ads and customer interaction and customer service. And they're now looking at expanding their um, their footprint to to Amazon. So we've uh, uh, we continue to work with a, a number of, of brands in that capacity. So that's what I call the boring stuff about me. But to go to your question, if you don't mind, I'm just going to share my screen quickly because uh, I think. While we know Amazon, um, sorry, e-commerce is rapidly growing, I think it's good to have eyes wide open on what the cost of that is. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. Okay. So quickly, we all know that e-commerce has been growing tremendously over the last couple of years, but especially in the last couple of months. And there's a number, this is a U.S. stat, but I think very representative of what's happening globally. Uh, based on many studies, 10 years of growth in terms of e-commerce has happened in three months. So now right. U.S. has been at this cusp and has been talking about it and brands have been talking about it. But again, for a number of different uh, reasons, the luxury and, nece- uh, and, 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 and out of necessity, sometimes um, that had not happened. But uh, with COVID, it certainly has been accelerated. So what does that really mean? Uh, let's talk about some of the kind of the greenhouse uh, gas emissions and carbon footprint impact of that. And then we'll talk about some additional advantages and disadvantages of it. Some of the, um, this is a very complicated um, study. Uh, and there's a number of different studies out there that try to prove out what is more efficient. Is e-commerce more efficient because of all obvious reasons you don't have as many customers going to stores or is it less efficient because people are ordering things a lot more often and uh, packaging and waste, et cetera? Some of the leading studies um, that I've uh, at least read have said at a high level, greenhouse gas emissions are about 17% lower for larger e-commerce and retail. So there is a little bit of efficiency from a carbon footprint standpoint when you're talking about um, e-commerce as opposed to traditional retail. Tack that on with Amazon and Walmart and, and companies all across the world, um, uh, at least explicitly saying that they are very focused on uh, becoming either net zero carbon emissions or a lot more um, conscious of their, their carbon footprint. And Amazon said they're going to invest billions of dollars, for example, as part of that. That sounds like um, that's better for the environment at a, at a, at a 10,000 level. Now, the devil is in the details. So Amazon has made a number of different promises and pledges. Uh, the fact of the matter is when you look at 2019 or 2018, Amazon's carbon footprint actually grew 15% despite a bunch of what they've said. Uh, and then uh, there's a number of um, leading um, uh, professors and analysts that have been studying this. And uh, a very interesting quote, a lot of the advantage that you have from a carbon footprint standpoint in e-commerce goes away when you start talking about a one or two day delivery, which is now becoming the norm and obviously wasn't the case before. Quick quote here from an MIT professor, when customers want to receive a product in one or two days, carbon emissions increase substantially. If you're willing to wait a week, it's like killing 20 trees instead of 100 trees. In addition to that, what a, um, a lot of text on here, so I try to bold this up, but I thought very interesting to talk about some of the uh, negative consequences of, again, e-commerce. Return rates, so now you have something like fashion, and Amazon has become the largest fashion apparel retailer, uh, apparel retailer in the in the U.S., uh, bigger than Walmart, bigger than Macy's, which sounds great, but many of those customers are returning their products. Uh, and there's a, a study that said that about a third of online shoppers return a purchase in the previous three months. So now, when you're talking about returning in e-commerce, you're talking about double transportation, oftentimes you're talking about disposal, uh, disposal rather than resale. And then to, to, to add on to it, Singles Day, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and upcoming Prime Day uh, are all uh, additional sales tactics by retailers and e-commerce platforms that uh, drive additional traffic. That also places an intense amount of packaging, shipping, and delivery um, uh, uh, issues in a relatively short amount of time, plus, again, everything that we just talked about. 
So that gap is probably not as big as we think when we look at where, where e-commerce is heading. So the benefits really quickly, I think we're all on the same page on the general benefits of e-commerce, convenience, absolutely, value, you can do a lot more price shopping, personalization, although sometimes um, people use personalization um, as a disadvantage of e-commerce when done right, and you have recommendations on um, what products you should be buying and what products you're interested in, uh, in and what products are compatible to, to products that you have at home. Um, personalization certainly can be uh, an advantage of e-commerce assortment so now you don't have to worry about three different uh, types of uh, keyboards you can or you can browse through 15,000 pages essentially yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you but we have uh, limited time left and um, yeah just because we need to be very careful about time so people can join to different other panels so let's make like five uh, maybe like 20 30 seconds final words uh, from each of you that you want to say to inspire you know, all community and uh, people around the globe about uh, e-commerce and everything. So, uh, Tina, we can start with you and then uh, randomly. Uh, sure. Uh, so, uh, I'm very much uh, uh, positive about the future of retail because I think uh, this has, uh, the recent situation has forced everybody into innovation. And I also believe that the latest technologies with uh, converting, uh, you know, uh, normal e-commerce to conversations can also help reduce returns, return, reduce the, save the uh, footprint, you know, the carbon footprint, and also optimize the supply chain. So I think it's like a win-win uh, where you bring a human touch to digital and you bring digital to stores. That's yeah. what, that's what my final. Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, Brandon, you want to be next? Uh, or anyway. right. Yeah, to me, I'll, I'll start with where I, I'll end where I started, which is, to me, it's all about the, the purchasing experience. So it doesn't matter what kind of commerce you're doing, you know, if you're marketing or selling anything, it's, it's everything is being digitized and you have to make that experience as personal as possible. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, Sherry? Yes, I know we're short on time. So, I mean, I guess the only thing I can say is that e-commerce is just going to advance more and more. This is just when I would say it's really beginning. You might think it's a saturated market. We might think Amazon dominates. There's always room for a new player, and it's just going to get better and better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there is no space because, you know, it's still growing, and we're probably somewhere at the beginning of that trend. Uh, yeah. uh, Sandy? I just uh, said what I wanted to say that, you know, guys get ready because this is just, uh, you know, uh, a beginning of a total shift, uh, which is uh, probably the end of the Internet of Things. Okay. Uh, Fahim, anything left? Yep. Uh, customers are increasingly looking at convenience, and e-commerce is a great way to provide convenience. So, if you think about personalization and convenience, because uh, that's clearly going to be the trend of the future. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I fully agree that uh, we are on somewhere of beginning of the trend, or maybe not the beginning, but definitely not at the end. And, and uh, there are a lot of opportunities for every, every person, and uh, you're right that it's more like about customer experience, and uh, by accepting that, we have to do some, some more positive things. So I want to thank everyone for joining our uh, panel. I want to thank my panelists and uh, yes, yeah, so see you around here on Terrace's other uh, online uh, panels and it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you everyone. Thanks very much, George. Thank yeah, you very much. It. Thanks guys, nice to meet everyone. Nice to meet you.